So the island of Grenada in the West Indies is known as a Spice Isle, famed for its landscape, its beaches, but also its people. Um, and one of the people that I am super keen to connect all of you with is Chantelle George, who is an amazing historian. Um, Chantelle, I first connected with you probably close to a decade ago, right? You were studying at SOAS. What did you study there? So I did my PhD in history. So I was doing African diaspora history and I did my undergrad at SOAS as well. And what was the topic of your um, thesis? It was called Liberated Africans in Grenada, 1836 to present. So I was looking at how they came to Grenada, but also their cultural legacies in present day Grenada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember, so I, we connected for a project that I was working on back in the day called Grenada 14. You're like a talented young researcher. And I remember your, your story of your family or your mum is originally from River Sally. Is that right? True. Yeah. Right. And remind me, what was it that led you to this area of research? Because for many of us who have grown up in the diaspora, the connection to Grenada is quite tenuous. So for you to actually spend time here researching, like what, what led you to, to want to research that field? That is an interesting question. I would say, oof, I've always been interested in history. My dad has always um, talked about Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, other important icons. And my mum would talk um, too, if you ask questions about some of the cultural legacies in Grenada. So for example, women going to the boiling springs, and doing certain ceremonies and where they wrap their head or you know certain individuals in Grenada and then coupled with my interest in African history that I studied as an undergrad I wanted to join sort of African diaspora with um or shall I say African history with Caribbean history in my own academic journey obviously it's intertwined but I sought for ways in which I could study my own history, Grenada history specifically, but looking at the African background to Grenada, because I think um, often it's a story that there's so much more to know and there's so much that can be discovered by looking in the archives, but also talking to people in Grenada and observing cultural um, legacies, such as Shango or African work. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think that's a large part of the reason that I'm here. Um, both to connect to like my and like the older people, the people in the 80s who are still alive, um, but also just to kind of understand the land more, the places more, the spaces more. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I remember you, I think there was a video that you recorded was, I don't know if it was a Shango ceremony, maybe I'm using the wrong terminology, um, but there were people dressed in red, um, the goat was sacrificed, there's another one of drumming, mm -hmm. and that's, that's an aspect of Grenada that a lot of people don't feel comfortable acknowledging. I know, remember my dad um, talking about growing up in the middle of nowhere in St. Andrews and watching a Shango ceremony and being really scared. And there's a lot of fear, a lot of layers to it. What, what was your experience of, of researching that aspect of Grenada that is quite significant in many ways? Yeah, that's a good question. So I agree with you, there's lots of apprehension, there's lots of stigmatization. Um, even talking to my family in oh, what I think 2011, I started, you know, doing some research in Grenada and saying, look, I'm, I want to look into this, who should I speak to? And, you know, there were warnings <laughs> as I like, don't go there, don't do that, be careful. And so, yes, yeah, so I, I reflect on that a lot as an outsider, right, so to speak, but also as someone that is Grenadian, um, I think, or identifies as Grenadian. I had a Grenadian passport, but it's not expired. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's really interesting to sort of interview people, talk to others, and bearing in mind that stigmatization, the struggle that people have gone, have experienced, right, to maintain those traditions. So yeah, um, I think it's been called Shango, and I would say that now practitioners prefer the term African work, okay. but in the literature on Grenada from M.G. Smith in the 1950s, Shango, um, and Shango is a deity in the Yoruba Fon, 
um, belief system. So it's known as that, but yeah, people mainly call themselves African work, African work practitioners, or even spiritual Baptist practitioners. Those are distinct traditions. But um, yeah, it was it was a you know it was so fascinating to see that. I never thought I would encounter it um, because not something like you say has been talked about. So when I was there observing ceremonies, when people trusted me um, to enter in these conversations or to observe ceremonies, it was really special. Um, it was heartwarming, and I felt right. You know, I want to tell more of these stories. I want to share more of these experiences so I'm so, so very grateful to the practitioners I can't wait to get back out there it's been uh, seven five to seven yeah. years so you need to come back you must you must and why do you feel it's important to tell these stories hmm. yeah I think the stigmatization I think the struggle specifically women what they have gone through to maintain their belief systems you know, it's a belief that has been repressed, um, um, you know, uh, colonial era, but even after the colonial era, Protestant Christianity, um, and even to some extent, um, yeah, Protestant Christianity, I would say, has been um, a faith that has restricted, that has been involved in um, the stigmatization of these practices in Grenada. Um, so I want to hear more of these stories. I want to hear how people have, you know, survived, especially since Grenada is comparatively small and Trinidad is that bigger island and it's connected to, more closely connected to the broader um, Orisha worship. So sometimes you can also call it Orisha worship, which is, I would say it's preferred term in Trinidad, but especially the wider African diaspora. So it's connected to places like Brazil, Trinidad. Um, and West Africa, but Grenada is sort of isolated. Um, that's my uh, uh, conclusion on all my belief. Um, but I think that people access um, that faith or the broader Orisha religion through Trinidad, so it's back and forth. So this migration within the Caribbean, I'm very interested in too. Um, yeah, and there's also, it's interesting too, it's also, you know, these songs, um, these belief systems, these stories are also archived, so we can learn so much about our past, not only about African work or Shango, but about slavery, indenture, you know, it tells us so much about the Grenadian past. Yeah, absolutely, and I think for me it's also got interesting lessons for the present as well, literally just this morning I was, um, reading an excerpt on Facebook from an estate manager. And it was a Q&A asking him about how he felt about pregnant women and breastfeeding women. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, it's cheaper for us to let, let these kids die and bring new people over from Africa. Like this is the reality that our ancestors had to survive in. That's and true. not only did they survive, they were able to thrive. And how did they do that? Why did they do that? And I think mm -hmm. spirituality there, I don't know, just philosophy for getting through absolute hell. I think there's mm. there's lessons in that that could be of use for us. Um, mm. So yeah, I'm not an academic, but I think people like you inspire me. And I think yeah, the more of us who are here having this conversation, if even if people don't feel comfortable about it, I think it's um, it's necessary. So tell me tell me more about some of the um, I'm going to use the wrong term, not projects the research papers that you're working because you're also working on a book right it's called the yoruba are on a rock liberated africans and african work in grenada so i examine the thousands 2700 specifically of african peoples that were sent to uh, grenada between 1836 and 1863 and I look at their cultural, their experiences, right? That survival piece is so important, as you mentioned. Um, so arriving in Grenada before enslavement was over in 1838, the system of enslavement. So during indenture, 1834 to 1838, liberated Africans arrived from 1836. So um, they would have been working alongside enslaved peoples on the plantation and, even working alongside 
um, indentured Indians from 1857. So it's interesting to think about these different peoples that would have met um, and their tradition shared. And I've got some interesting material um, about sort of the overlap of these different cultural traditions in Grenada from, you know, different um, ethnic groups. So, um, yeah, I look at the, so it's been, it's been quite difficult, I would say, to find information. You know, there's information in the National Archives in the UK. I did um, look at newspapers in Grenada, um, and that's another thing we can discuss, the state of the National Library. The documents that time, I think 2011, were disintegrating. Um, and so I was able to see what I could. Um, but, you know, newspapers are so important. Protecting Grenada's heritage is, is paramount, paramount. So who came, when they came, um, which ship, what were the conditions? So they're recaptured. So from 1807, Britain patrolled the Atlantic Ocean um, and would find um, enslaved peoples or on ships usually owned by other um, European powers and would liberate them, quote unquote, and send them to the nearest colony, Sierra Leone, St. Helena, or the Caribbean. And quite a few um, were recaptured near the coast of Grenada, 1836, um, 1837. And so they were sent to that island. Some are sent via Sierra Leone, as I mentioned, and St. Helena. So it's really fascinating to think and also disturbing reading about their different journeys reading about people that would have lost family in that process of recapture. So this is definitely not a benevolent act. Um, these enslaved peoples, yes, would have ended up on plantations in Brazil and Cuba, but you know their experiences in Grenada during indenture were not that different from the slavery system itself, um, especially you know, in 1836 when the system of slavery was still ongoing. They were indentured for about one to five years or one to three years rather. Um, and, you know, children could be re-indentured up to the age of 18. And um, there's lots of evidence of um, punishment um, and just a lot of restriction of movement. But at the same time, you know, they did have more autonomy also, um, they, they were able to exercise autonomy over their religious lives. And, you know, reading in the archives has been really touching stories of them visiting other peoples from the same um, ship as them from the slave, same slave ship or um, recaptured um, ship. So, yeah, it's that story of survival, um, of connection um, that's been so inspiring to, to try and tell. Yeah, and you also did some work looking at the areas within Grenada where they tended to settle. With Munich was one of them, wasn't wasn't it? But where else did they tend to move to? Yeah, so there's some documentation where they settled. So Munich was a major one. So thinking about the villages, they communities in those villages that established, or sometimes villages themselves, following enslavement. Munich, Concord, La Mode, but also Black Bay. And I also think River Sally um, has been identified as one of these areas, Laura as well, from oral history. Um, they established communities practicing, especially, you know, um, African work or Shango, one of these early places. And Munich itself has, you know, a tremendous memory of these practices. And that was the main place in Grenada where I gained um, so much insight about, um, African works. Yeah, no, I love that. And I love the fact that we're sort of reaching a time frame where people who have those oral histories are, are going to fade out. So it's amazing that you're documenting that. And I think even more of that in your staff. And I know that there's um, some work being done by the, is it the Grenada Trust on intangible cultural, what's the terminology? Yeah, I think it is intangible heritage. That's yeah. It. Yeah. Um, so that's really exciting to observe. Mm -hmm. um, and you're also working on a book on colon, right? Which is interesting because my cousin who was born in Grenada is a Babalao in Trinidad. And he's saying, listen, we need more colon. You guys can grow it, get us some. So even now in like the 21st century, that overlap and that spirituality is still 
circling. Look, tell me more about the research on the colon. I want to find out. I would love to find out more about your cousin, because so is it grown in not so much grown in Trinidad, but there's this idea or there's this existence that it's grown in Grenada. Yes. Yeah, mm. there's a market for it in Trinidad. And I bumped into a rest guy in La Digue who grows a lot of um, cola nut. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is something I've never seen a cola nut tree. I've oh, seen really? <laughs> I've seen the the seat, you know, the cola themselves. Uh-huh. Um, in you know London or yeah, in Glasgow um but I haven't seen them yet um and it's just beautiful this the, the pod it looks amazing I can't wait to yeah I mean I may have passed by in Nigeria or Grenada unknowingly but I've never sort of sat under one or talked to a grower I can't wait to do that so the book is in its very early stages um It'll probably be called something like Cola in the Atlantic world, but I'm so interested, and I've talked about it before, um, we've talked about it before, on how, you know, the importance of small objects and what they can tell us about religion, migration, slavery. Um, so I think studies on global commodities have often focused on sugar, coffee, cotton, these, you know, really profitable commodities. Um, and these studies often portray enslaved peoples as just producers or even African peoples as just producers rather than traders or consumers of these global commodities. So people that produced for European consumption. But I think cola, I think what's so special about it is because it's been traded for thousands of years, you know, before Europeans even heard about it. Um, and it's been used, um, or hundreds of years, or maybe more. Um, and it's been used for religion, it's been used um, for sociality. There's so many purposes that it served within West Africa as a dye, for example. Um, societies like the Igbo societies, Yoruba societies, it's really widespread. But it also traveled on um, slave ships and was sent to the Americas, used to improve the taste of water, and some narratives say that it was carried by enslaved peoples themselves as an object of survival of sustenance. Um, there's evidence that it was also used within plantations to buy enslavers to sort of increase their profitability, so um, giving it to enslaved people so they could quote unquote, work harder um, or also prevent suicides. This was also said in one medical journal that I've read. So various uses, but also used by enslaved peoples to resist the system of slavery. So used within uh, African work is where I first encountered or heard about cola in Grenada um, by Benedict Andrews um, in yeah, before 2011, can't quite remember, 2013. My main, um, the main person I worked with in Grenada on the Shango and who mentioned the cola nut and I was so interested and wanted to find out more about it. And then of course, in the late 19th century, it was used as a drug and tonic in Europe and North America, um, Coca-Cola for example, but also really interesting sort of strange or abstract items such as you know, coffee or um, chocolate or lozenges, wine. Wow. So I guess another argument is that the use of it was mirrored by Europeans who considered Africans as barbaric and backward and who didn't apparently know the value of commodities. <laughs> so yeah, I think it makes an interesting argument and I can't wait to research more about the topic by traveling to the Caribbean and um, Brazil would be a really important location too. Yeah, definitely. Has a book been written on the topic before? So there's been some really interesting work by Edmund Abaka, who's written on the cola nut trade and its use in Western Africa. Um, and some references to its use in the Americas, but there hasn't been a single study that has um, looked at its use um, in various um, locations across the Atlantic in one volume and Latin America and the Caribbean is severely under-researched or cola in that area is severely under-researched so there's not been a single book that's looked at its uses over time and space. 
Um, but there's been some really important work by African historians, um, anthropologists, um, and even some geographers that have mentioned Kona in their in the, in 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 their work. I love it. It sounds like a future Netflix series wait, waiting to be made. Thank oh, you. thank you. <laughs> it's a global appeal. It's yeah. I think it sounds amazing, amazing. Um, and so, what else are you working on? Can we mention what's happening in Karaku or not yet? I think Grenadians, people of Grenadian descent in diaspora and in Grenada, have been really pushing for social media discussions and privately ways in which we could really kind of protect our heritage and tell the world about it, right? And honor those people that have been so vital in that, in the maintaining of that heritage. So we're gonna organize a conference, hopefully in Karaka in June, um, talking about different aspects of our heritage from nation dance to Musaraka to Scotland's involvement in slavery um, and thinking about reparations. I think it's really interesting to look out for that. And that's, you know, happening in the Caribbean, which is so important. Yeah, and I didn't say your official title at the beginning because I just know Chantel, but what is your title and what is it like being um, an academic at the University of Glasgow in these times? Because it's funny, I went, I start, I did my undergrad at Glasgow and it's, it's interesting in hindsight, knowing the level of involvement in slavery, having been there, the privilege and the la la la. So how do you, how do you work through that? And, and most importantly, what is your title? Yeah, so that's a good question. So lecturer in transatlantic slavery. Um, so I joined University of Glasgow about two years ago, 2021, January. And I must admit, you know, I, we know about the British legacy, but isolating it and thinking about the Scottish uh, involvement in slavery has been very, it's been disturbing. It's, it's led to other regional studies, London, um, you know, not, the, not that the Scottish um, angle has led to these, but I think people now are beginning to look at, you know, different regional studies, not just Britain as a whole, right? It kind of obscures sometimes these individual actors, these ports. So yeah, University of Glasgow um, did a report a few years ago that detailed that it's uh, money that was involved, early money in its foundation, um, much some a significant proportion some of it derived from um, enslavement and colonization so there's been some important steps to think about what that means um, and um, and make that step for reparations and that's through scholarships for example to caribbean students to african students to also black british black mixed or mixed um, race students, um, but also um, working with the University of the West Indies. So I think other universities have also um, made some similar gestures or actions. I think it's really important. So the Scottish legacy, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time when I was doing the research, but, but more and more I look into it, I th I've got a list um, of liberated Africans that were sent to an uh, several states in 1850 um, and about one third of them seem to be indentured to Scottish individuals or to estates owned by Scottish people so I think this is so important and then the more I look into cola too you know it was used in Scotland too and some of the uh, key medical doctors involved in the Caribbean Africa were Scottish explorers involved in um, these imperial expeditions in west and west central africa were scottish so it's 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 been um disturbing but i feel it's important work to do um as well yeah no, that's exciting and so if folks want to look out for you i guess they should keep their eyes peeled for this book to come i'll put a link to some of your papers below because i think i i had no idea that indentured Africans even existed until they came across your paper. So yeah, I think you're really, I mean, hopefully most people are less ignorant than I am, but I think you're really shining a light on some, some areas that um, we as a nation could do with knowing more about. So it's been a huge pleasure to talk to you. 
Thank you, Zoe, and thank you for all that you do in promoting this research and the research you do yourself on our experiences and cultures. It's so important for us to continue to work together. So thank you for your support.